Where's my money? <laughs> if you watched the last two videos, you'll know we cut these four gears. We started off with gear basics and worked our way through what you'd need. A cutter and a way to divide your work so the cutter can do its thing. I didn't get into the very fine meat and potatoes. However, you've made yourselves heard. You'd like to see that. Totally reasonable request. So in this video, I thought we could make a couple more gears. More differenter gears. Show you all the steps and in a roundabout, sneaky way, so you don't catch on to what's really happening, go through a second, faster example to help drive home what we did last time. Last time we made a pair of 100 tooth module one gears because I needed them for the mini lathe. This time we're going to make one or two 15 tooth gears, but module two. The reason I want 15 tooth module two, which I'll share with you in just a moment, is just as pressing as my need for these 100 tooth gears. Speaking of which, lots of comments asking why one would spend a ton of money to build gears you could otherwise buy for a dollar. Well, good point there, except not all gear cutting projects are cutting standard gears. There are a lot of parts in this world with built-in gear-like features, built-in gears. For example, some clutches and flywheels have integral gears. Lots of small machine shafting have gearing built right in, in places where a stock gear along with keys or pins or whatever they might need wouldn't work for maybe structural or space reasons. And sometimes, of course, you just need an oddball gear you can't buy or wouldn't want to spend your money on. Not to mention that why isn't really a valid question in the context of a home machine shop. Okay, back to the task at hand, a 15 tooth module two gear. I've got a module two cutter that should cover my 15 tooth gear profile. Next, we'll need a blank to cut our gears into, plastic, steel, brass, wood, the bones of your enemies, whatever is appropriate for the project at hand. In this case, I've got a piece of aluminum. I think I can carve that gear out of this. And in order to do that, in order to cut 15 teeth into this thing, it has to be the correct diameter to accept 15 teeth. So we end up with a whole number of teeth around its perimeter. So the gear works. You could figure this out in a couple of ways. First, you could look at a print, of course but odds are you don't have one and no one does detailed drawings of stock gears anymore. Second, you could look it up in a book or online. From the machinery's handbook in the metric gear section, we see the OD of the blank we need to start with is the number of teeth plus two times the module. In my case, that would be 15 tooth plus two, which is 17 times two, 34 millimeters. We need a 34 millimeter blank for our new gear. If you have a CAD package that can generate gears, you can use the smarts built into that and read the dimensions right out of the model. Here I'm showing Fusion 360, since it's free and more or less readily accessible. You'll have to download an add-in for the gear generation. Go to the Fusion store and search for a spur gear or gear generator. It's free, that's how I got this one. Run that app or script or whatever and you'll get a pop-up window. There I'll add the details we're interested in, click OK and I get my gear. Now I can take measurements right from the model. Again, the OD of this gear should be 34 millimeters. <laughs> Finally, you can try to find a spec sheet or print online. I mean, this is a bit sketchy, but I suppose it is an option. Let's see if McMaster has a 15 tooth module two gear. And of course they do, I mean, who are we kidding? Looks like for a steel gear this size, they want about 17 bucks. If we look at the details, we'll see the OD is, again, 34 millimeters. So this story's holding up. Note that all these numbers we've been talking about, or will be talking about, are nominal. I've made no mention of tolerances here, except for the number of teeth. We do need exactly 15 teeth, no plus or minus about that part of it. If fit and tolerance are important to your application, to what you're doing, you'll need to dig deeper than just this video. This happens to be one and a half inch stock, about 40 millimeters. So I need to turn this down a bit. I have to get it down to 34 before I can start gear cutting. The reason I'm making a 15 tooth module two gear is because I found this piece of stock in my cutoff bin. And here it is, 34 millimeter blank, or perhaps in more approachable terms, 1.33858 inches. We're on the milling machine, of course. The dividing head's installed. In fact, it hasn't moved since those last two videos. And I've got the right cutter installed. I want to cut into the chuck, in towards the dividing head, so I'm on the back side in this case. It would have been nice to flip that cutter and cut the gear teeth on our side just for better visibility, but I don't have enough Y-axis on this machine to move the cutter to this side. I'd have to move the whole dividing head back another spot on the table. If these were gears you really needed, You'll want to take some care and think about how you move the blank from machine to machine. Meaning I just turn this down on the lathe in a three jaw chuck 
and now I just moved it to a three jaw chuck on the mill. Since I don't particularly care in this case, I just took the work out of the lathe and put it here in the dividing head. But be aware the odds are pretty high you'll pick up concentricity error. The axis my lathe cut this gear blank around is probably not the same axis this chuck will pick up or has picked up. In other words, this blank is probably not on the same center it was when it was in the lathe. I'm sure it's close, but it's not exact. If I put an indicator on this and spun it around, it would likely wobble. Again, if this were important, you'd want to indicate that in, do it in centers on a mandrel you trust, maybe mount it on a four jaw chuck instead of a three jaw chuck, a call it, whatever. In fact, some people are set up so that they can move their work and their lathe chuck together from machine to machine. Instead of taking the work out of the chuck on the lathe, you'd take the whole three jaw chuck off with the work in it and install it on the dividing head. Hope you followed that, but these are the sort of details that really separate good work from bad work. Like literally a concentricity error will separate your gear. Bear with me a moment. I think that point was probably worth driving home. I've put an indicator on the work. It's zeroed out and I'll spin the head. We'll see how much error we picked up just moving from the lathe. Had we have measured this in the lathe after the cut, that indicator wouldn't have moved. It would've been dead on zero because the cut was made in the lathe. But since we moved it, well, there are consequences to deal with. This particular setup's got about a seven thousandths error. It's up to you to decide if that's a big deal for what you're trying to do or not. In my case, the only thing this gear is gonna do is drive a video, so seven thou should be fine. Next step is to get the cutter in position. This cutter will only work properly when it's on center line. There are probably a lot of ways to do this, but what I did in the last video is to simply touch the cutter off on the top using a slip of paper, move the cutter down the thickness of that paper plus half the thickness of the cutter, and then I could just move the whole thing down half the diameter of the work, or 17 millimeters, and I should be golden. You could, of course, use something like a height gauge to pick up the top of your work and line up your cutter with it. Better yet, install an indicator like we had when we measured the runout and use that to zero your cutter. Same goes for picking up the outside diameter of the work. The cutter's on center line in the up-down direction, I guess, in the Z direction. And now it's time to set the depth of cut. I'm using the same slip of paper technique just till I feel a slight drag and then I know I'm exactly one paper thickness away from the surface of the work. But you could have used an edge finder ahead of time or do some kind of a scratch pass. But more to the point, how deep should we make our gear teeth? And just like before, unless you're developing your own gear standard, depth of cut we look up in a book. I did anyway, but we covered where you might cheat and find this dimension. Look online or pull it from CAD. There are formulas, of course. I think for metric, I had to look this up. For metric, it's 2.25 times the module. So for module two, that would be 4.5 millimeter depth. That's for a theoretical gear on its own, I believe. My book says 4.3 millimeters and some change. The difference, I believe, includes some clearance depending which standard you're working to. Let's call it 4.3 for our example. Now I already know this next part is going to be divisive. We need to do some math. If I've told you once, I've told you a million times, this is a 40 to one dividing head. 40 turns of the handle equals one turn of the work. Personally, I always like to double check. 32 fortieths, 33 fortieths. I need to make 15 divisions on that end, so I need to make 15 divisions on this end. 40 fifteenths reduces to, I guess to really spell it out for you, 15 fifteenths plus 15 fifteenths plus 10 fifteenths, which if you check your fractions tables is two whole turns plus an additional 10 holes on a 15 hole plate, which as luck would have it is right there, 15 holes. So I don't even have to switch to another plate. How serendipitous. I do, however, have to move the indexing pin, the handle. It's still set up for the 20 hole pattern. So I just loosen this screw here and shift the whole handle down to the whole circle that I need. In contrast to the hunter tooth gear, where we made only partial divisions per cut, I think that was four tenths per cut. Now we need to make two full turns of the handle before we count off 10 additional holes. Now I've already set the sector arms to span 10 holes of the 15. So this ditty is gonna go a little something like this. And a one and a two and a 10 more holes. Make a cut, advance the sector arms. One, two full turns, 10 additional holes. Make a cut, etc. so forth and ad nauseum.
All right, my collective dudes. I think that's it. 15 tooth module two spur gear. I hope that covered some of my emissions from the last video. As always, thanks for watching. Some of my emissions from the last video. As always, thanks for watching. That's how you want to end this? Just like my wife always mumbles when she's walking away from me. If you need something done right. You can't always hold a gear like this in a three jaw chuck. The hundred tooth gears from before were really too thin to do this. I had to use soft jaws, but had you have done it right, you would have had them on a mandrel and a mandrel you can put into a three jaw chuck. Now this gear happens to fit. It's a 15 tooth and 15 teeth is divisible by three jaws. How serendipitous. After years of research and development, it's finally here. My three speed push stick for the bandsaw. I parted off three gears because of course it's a three speed push stick, cleaned up each face and knocked a small chamfer on the teeth. But you know, I never figured out why they do that, chamfer teeth. I mean, not on all gears, but frequently on machined gears. I do it, frankly, because I think they look better. You can charge more for parts that look better. But if anyone knows if that's really a thing and why they do it, please share. I mean, it makes sense for sprockets, but gears, I don't know. Well, here's hoping that answered more questions than it raised. Thanks for watching.